the State of the Net West. I want to thank our generous hosts here at Morrison Forrester for providing this space for us today. Uh, as a small Capitol Hill organization, uh, we are greatly indebted to our partners here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University School of Law. The High Tech Law Institute has been immensely helpful to us in organizing these events. Uh, Stand in that West events are unique, and they're designed to help inform the technology policy discussions in Washington. Uh, by bringing together congressional members, uh, Silicon Valley academic scholars, public interest advocates and industry in an open town hall format, we hope to inform debates that go on in DC. Uh, these, are important these are important technology issues, and we feel that uh, interaction between these stakeholders can encourage better communication on these important topics. So this event series leads up to our annual State of the Net conference that we hold every year. It's the largest and most influential technology policy conference in the nation. It's held on Capitol Hill. This year's conference will be on January 22nd and 23rd, and registration opens on October 15th. So we want to hear from you as we work to build events like today and events in the future. Uh, you know, we really want you to engage with us on our social uh, media platforms and we hope to keep the discussion going. And with that, I'd like to introduce Christopher Hyde, Managing Partner for Morrison Forrester, uh, for today's discussion. Thank you very much for coming. Hello, my, yeah, my name is Chris Hyde, I'm the Managing Partner here at Palo Alto. I'll keep my comments brief, because I know none of you came to see me. Uh, but I did want to uh, just quickly uh, mention that MoFo and myself, I'm, I'm in uh, the patent prosecution space, so I'm mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the internet and software area, so I'm sort of on the, the, the front lines here fighting some of these patent battles that you hear about and read about, uh, as well as the firm itself. But I do want to give a special thanks to the Congresswoman uh, uh, for helping bring the Patent Office to Silicon thank Valley. It's a huge thing. So, so thank you very much. Uh, I think it's going to be a great thing for the Silicon Valley and innovation and companies here. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Congresswoman, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Chris, very much. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Everyone Good awake? Good morning. Good. That's great. Um, thank you, Eric, for your, uh, uh, for your introduction, and, and uh, thank you to all of you for inviting me to uh, uh, the State of the Net West Conference. Uh, I think it was last year. We d we did it last year, but mm -hmm. we weren't here. We were at where were we? We were in. Um, at, uh, were we at Fenwick West or at Wilson, Wilson? Wilson? At Wilson Cincini. That's yeah. right. We were at Wilson, Wilson Cincini. Yeah. So, uh, I'm delighted and uh, uh, to be here. Thank you for your good words about the uh, uh, the uh, the real victory for us in uh, in our region in bringing a uh, uh, a patent office uh, to Silicon Valley and. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, we went at it in the first round. We lost uh, we lost out to Detroit, uh, but uh, we were bound and determined. I, I think sometimes when when you lose the first round, uh, you go for the knockout in the next one. So uh, this is, after all, the innovation capital of our country. It makes all the sense in the world. And when you look uh, and to see where uh, so many patents are are generated, uh, they certainly come out of the valley. So. Uh, I think that this is going to be, uh, uh, this is a real win for us. It's a very important win, and uh, um, uh, we're, the, uh, the delegation is really very proud of the work that we did. And the Silicon Valley Leadership Group also, uh, I want to salute because um, uh, I always say I know what to do inside the institution and where the pressure points are, uh, but you also need a real push from the outside. And uh, uh, they were invaluable uh, with all of the businesses uh, speaking out and being part of that organization. So I want to salute them. So um, uh, it's uh, it's good to be home and not have to uh, commute every weekend. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I know that I'm uh, at home. You know, it <laughs> is, uh, w when you commute before you open your eyes, you think, "Where am I? Am I in D.C. or am I at home in California?" So it's good to be here. I note that you're, the conference is going to take place um, right after the inauguration. So get your inauguration tickets and then stay for the uh, uh, for the big conference. How's that? Sounds good. All right. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you know when when I speak at, uh, at at gatherings that one of the most common things that you see with the audience is that uh, 
uh, people uh, have laptops, they have their smartphones, they have uh, their tablets, and it really is a reflection of the insatiable appetite uh, for wireless broadband. I think that most of you know uh, that uh, uh, I'm the ranking member of, the, uh, of a very important subcommittee, uh, which is the Communications and Internet Subcommittee. Uh, that's kind of Washington talk, but uh, uh, what it means is, is that I'm the lead Democrat, and uh, Congressman uh, Greg Walden is the chairman of that very important subcommittee. So that's the first place where the table is set in terms of uh, all telecommunications and internet issues for our country. And uh, whatever legislation uh, we consider and we write at that subcommittee then goes to the full committee and then uh, to the full house. And uh, likewise, um, in the Senate, uh, it's uh, the first time that I've ever served in a role like that. I really didn't go to Congress to be a chair of anything or a ranking member, but I have to say that I've enjoyed it. Uh, and I enjoy working with, uh, with Greg Walden. In fact, he's going to be coming into the district and we're going to be uh, making some rounds this week uh, uh, and going out to different businesses and meeting with them and hear uh, what they think we should be, um, you know, should be a high priority in the next Congress. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. But getting back to wireless broadband, uh, last year alone, uh, the U.S. mobile data traffic grew by almost 300 percent. Imagine that, by almost 300 percent, just uh, last year alone. And uh, with traffic estimated to uh, grow an additional 16 times by 2016, we have to make freeing up more spectrum a top priority. And the subcommittee has been very, very, with a laser beam focus uh, on this very subject. Uh, recognizing that the looming spectrum crunch is very real. Uh, much of my work, as I just said, as ranking member of the uh, subcommittee, has been focused on how to repurpose uh, this scarce resource uh, toward wireless broadband. Uh, when I talk about spectrum at other town hall meetings with, uh, uh, with a, a broader base of, uh, of, uh, of constituents, I always say, you know, you can't go to Nordstrom, you can't go to Neiman's, you can't go to Macy's uh, to, uh, uh, to, to buy Spectrum. Uh, it really is in the hands of the federal government. And uh, when you repurpose uh, or uh, open up Spectrum, the Congress really does not do this on a regular basis. This comes up at best uh, maybe once in a decade or more. So what we do, when we do it, and how we do it is really very, very important. Um, for almost 16 months from the beginning of, uh, of this Congress, the 112th Congress, for about 15 or 16 months we worked uh, to bring about bipartisan uh, a spectrum legislation uh, and it was passed earlier uh, uh, this year. Uh, is a very, very important accomplishment, I think, for the subcommittee. And, uh, you know, these things take on a life of their own. Uh, it's like a roller coaster ride. So one day you're on a high, everything's working out well. The next day uh, uh, there may be interests pulling on what you thought you got done yesterday and you think it's going to unravel. And, of course, it's uh, like a patent place, you know, it's not going to be done, it can't be done, and, you know, all of that. But, uh, um, I have a great sense of stick-to-itiveness, and uh, uh, I think because the chairman and I were able to work together uh, very well, I was bound and determined that we would have bipartisan legislation and that it would really serve the country well. So it was not only an accomplishment for the subcommittee, uh, most importantly, it's, a, it's, a, it's an accomplishment for the people of our country, and I think the consumers won in this as well. So the legislation included the following a public safety network. Uh, what's important to understand about this particular subject is that uh, the 9-11 Commission, which um, uh, when the book came out, uh, the publication, uh, it, it, it amazed me. And I'm constantly moving through airports. And the one thing that I noticed amid all of the chaos of whatever airport I was in, whether it was SFO or Dulles, was that people were sitting and reading 
the 9-11 Commission's report to the nation. Uh, there was one uh, recommendation of the 9-11 Commission that the Congress had not made good on, and it was this particular area. Uh, we all know uh, that on that fateful day when our country was attacked, uh, that police and fire in the same city could not communicate with each other. And uh, I have often thought to myself, what would the outcome have been if they could have? Uh, but that question tortures you. And uh, uh, so uh, I was bound and determined that we would address uh, this last recommendation that had been left on the table uh, unaddressed. Uh, so uh, we finally delivered on our promise uh, to uh, uh, our first responders uh, with a, a, to establish a nationwide interoperable uh, public communications network. And uh, uh, I, I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, also included in the, uh, in the le legislation was uh, Next Generation 911. Now, I've been working on 911 issues since uh, the mid-90s. Um, and I have to tell you, there was about as much interest in it as um, one of the dots in this carpet. Uh, uh, but it, it, really, um, it really kind of rose to, um, it's like kind of the cream rising to the top um, when our country was attacked. And uh, I think it was very much in front of the American people and therefore members of Congress, uh, people using their, uh, uh, their cell phones to call, to call their families, to say where they were and that they love them and essentially say goodbye. But uh, we have a, um, uh, a system uh, that really need, needed to be upgraded. So uh, in the legislation, there's a next-gen 911 system which will enable first uh, responders to receive photos, videos, and text messages uh, which can improve the quality and the speed of emergency response. And, uh, uh, you know, it's one of the... Um, it's one of the backbones of our uh, uh, emergency systems in the country that people take for granted. That people take for granted. Uh, but it has to, it had to be brought into the 21st century. So um, I'm very proud of that. We have a, uh, a 911 caucus, both in the House and the Senate. I was the founder in the House, in the Senate. It was uh, Senator Clinton and Senator Burns. Uh, so uh, that goes back a ways, but uh, uh, it's what we worked on uh, for a long time, and we finally succeeded in getting that into the legislation. Uh, very, very important area, unlicensed spectrum. In the first draft of the legislation that I'm talking about, unlicensed was not even included. And so um, I really pitched a campaign uh, amongst uh, committee members, Republicans and Democrats, so that they would understand what unlicensed represents, uh, that it's a, uh, it's a platform for innovation and that the Congress really needed to lean in on this and expand it. Um, uh, it really supports the next generation of entrepreneurs and small businesses. It enables new applications uh, and services like smart grid, uh, medical patient monitoring, and broadband uh, internet access uh, to local schools, libraries, and other anchor institutions. And uh, that was included in the, uh, in the legislation as well. And I, I think it's a real victory. Um, uh, it's always interesting to me what people know and what they don't know. And so you have to sometimes, uh, it, it's all right for someone not to know. Uh, uh, but it's up to um, you know, the legislator that is, um, is pushing, uh, uh, in this case, unlicensed spectrum. Uh, to explain to members uh, how unlicensed is working today. And I remember taking a huge chart into the uh, hearing room, putting it in front of the committee, and saying, uh, these are uses today of unlicensed, uh, but we need to uh, uh, preserve and expand this uh, so that uh, there actually is a, uh, a platform for innovation. Um, in the legislation, we have uh, incentive auction authority, and it's voluntary. This is the way we set it up this time. 
Um, so the repurposing is on a voluntary basis, and uh, broadcast television spectrum, um, uh, I, I, there is uh, obviously a growing demand uh, 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 for wireless broadband, and uh, I think that not only the revenues that will come into the federal government, which are in the billions of dollars, uh, and we had to work real well with the broadcasters. They were very nervous about what would happen. I had to keep reminding them that, uh, um, uh, you know, that our uh, uh, airwaves are owned by the American people. You know, <laughs> small important side note, right footnote. So um, now we're. Uh, uh, where are we now? Uh, right now. Uh, the, uh, uh, the agencies that are responsible for the different parts of the legislation of implementing them are implementing them, are setting them up. So uh, these important provisions are now uh, underway and uh, what I think we need to turn our attention to is to, um, uh, uh, to what is a, a faster, uh, a more robust uh, uh, wireless uh, broadband access, what it means for innovation, what it means for job creation, what it means for investment here uh, and across the country, here in Silicon Valley, but also across the country, and whether there are any barriers that stand in the way of continued growth. So um, you no sooner achieve something that you have to move on uh, and be ready uh, for the next chapter. So this is going to require oversight of the committee in the next, uh, in the next Congress, uh, but also ideas, ideas, ideas on how uh, uh, we can build on what we did. Um, now just uh, shifting gears to take a snapshot of where we are again, uh, just four years ago Apple's App Store contained <coughs> only 500 third-party apps. Only 500. And at that time, we thought that was incredible, right? Today, there are over 500,000. Imagine that. I mean, that someone just gasped. <laughs> You're right. You're right. And uh, based on a study that was just released uh, last week, the app economy has created 151,900 jobs right here in California. That's a lot of jobs. When you hear the job report nationally, uh, I mean, imagine that, 151,900 jobs in California with an economic impact of more than $8 billion. Uh, these apps, um, as you know, uh, they inform, they entertain, they make life uh, easier for an awful lot of people. But uh, no longer are mobile devices just a means for accessing email and basic news on the go. They now allow us to stream movies, to play online games, uh, and to participate in video conferences and much, much more. So despite this growth, uh, what I worry about uh, are a growing set of threats that could curtail what's underway. Um, as the FCC's open internet rules continue to be litigated, and they are uh, 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 constantly, constantly. Now I know I'm here at Morrison and Foster, so I don't want to put a crimp in your business, but uh, uh, the fact of the matter is is that uh, the FCC no sooner uh, will adopt a rule uh, that it is litigated. And um, uh, we've seen recent uh, examples that test the spirit of the rules that the FCC adopted, including the blocking of some customers from using Apple's uh, uh, FaceTime video app over at and uh, over the at and network. Now, should the court overturn the FCC's rules, and I believe that the FCC has the authority uh, in this area, uh, and I thought that it belongs under Title II and still maintain that, uh, I would act quickly to introduce legislation clarifying the Commission's authority to ensure that there's a free and open Internet. Uh, and uh, uh, prevent the use of uh, internet fast lanes or other discriminatory, uh, discriminatory rules. Uh, I feel very strongly about that. Uh, what also looks very different um, uh, is today's video marketplace. Uh, very different than the one that led Congress to uh, uh, pass the 1992 Cable Act. That's the year that I was elected to Congress, so I didn't participate in that. Uh, but I certainly followed it. 
uh, because there were many constituents that were uh, interested in it um, uh, when I was campaigning. Now this has led many to ask whether changes in the way people use video, particularly online, requires a congressional update. Clearly, uh, consumers want uh, the freedom and the flexibility to stream uh, video content wherever and whenever they want uh, and wherever they are. Uh, yet the rules pre uh, preventing uh, incumbent cable operati uh, operators from withholding affiliated content from uh, competitors never anticipated online-based services like uh, Xfinity, Stream, uh, Pix, or Hulu Plus. So while we should be caught, uh, I think, cautious not to enact rules that could curtail investment in these innovative services, their affiliation with incumbent providers shouldn't be used to lock out competitors. And I, I think that that's very, very important. You can tell that in the forefront of my thinking is always uh, consumers. Third is the use of um, uh, discriminatory uh, data caps and their potential to um, impact the growing uh, streaming video market. Earlier this summer, it was widely reported uh, that the uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice, had begun looking into whether data caps unfairly limit online uh, competition. And while we don't know the extent um, of this inquiry, um, it will fall on my subcommittee uh, to thoroughly examine the issue and to uh, ensure that future innovation uh, is not curtailed. So you can tell that there's not a moment's rest at the committee. Um, uh, the issues that we deal with uh, uh, really move at lightning speed. And you really have to be limber and uh, on your toes to um, uh, not only in anticipation, but to understand what's happening, uh, to examine it very, very thoroughly, uh, to um, uh, establish a broader understanding of, uh, of all of the members on both sides of the aisle, and, uh, and then uh, uh, move in a, um, in a very prudent way. Uh, finally, uh, there's the importance of data roaming rules that uh, promote uh, competition and the seamless availability of, uh, of wireless uh, uh, services that uh, uh, consumers have come to expect. Um, these rules are particularly important for smaller wireless carriers who ha often have very little choice, very little choice uh, for roaming partners other than <coughs> their largest uh, rivals. Uh, last month, there were oral arguments that were heard in a case uh, challenging the FCC's data roaming rules. Uh, I've consistently advocated for uh, the commission, the FCC, um, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, take action in this area, and I'll continue to do so uh, in order to ensure a competitive uh, wireless marketplace. Uh, the FCC has been very slow in this uh, in this area, and uh, it, um, I have to tell you, it pleased me when I uh, uh, got some of my colleagues to uh, sign on to what we call a dear colleague, uh, except it's to an agency, uh, and uh, uh, each one is uh, considered, uh, um, has a very good reputation on the committee. Uh, they know of what they speak, uh, they've had experience with it, not only in their own district, but uh, uh, see it as a national issue, and uh, we urge the FCC to take this on. And um, after um, silence and non-action for a long time, wouldn't you know, um, uh, there was some movement. So uh, we'll stay on this. Uh, I'm really proud of the uh, subcommittee's uh, accomplishments in this Congress. I don't have to remind any audience that um, that the Congress uh, is held in very low esteem. Uh, many constituents ask, what is it like to work in a place uh, where the, um, uh, you know, the overall approval rating is about 9%? And my response always is, I didn't think we had that many relatives. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, from the beginning of, um, of, uh, of the Congress, uh, I expressed to the chairman, to the subcommittee chairman, Greg Walden, that, uh, that I thought that we had the opportunity uh, to accomplish something on a bipartisan basis uh, and do something 
uh, that, uh, uh, that, that would stand out, make a contribution, expand our economy, uh, increase competition, uh, produce something for the consumers of the, uh, of the country, and uh, that we would be unlike so many other parts of the Congress. And uh, uh, that's where my pride springs from. And uh, I certainly didn't do this by myself. I'm not suggesting that. But, uh, uh, but I went into it with that attitude, and um, uh, I'm, I'm proud of what the subcommittee has been able to do. So in addition to what I've already highlighted uh, uh, this morning, uh, I expect that in the next Congress, regardless of the composition uh, of the Congress and how the American people express themselves in just a handful of weeks, um, uh, I think that there will, there's a need uh, for a continuing emphasis on, um, on how federal agencies uh, can more efficiently use their spectrum. Now this is an area that hasn't been examined for a long time. And uh, I, I think perhaps one of the reasons that Congress didn't get into it is because the DOD is a huge holder and user of spectrum. And that is uh, considered almost sacred ground. Uh, to you know, and that you should not tread on that ground. Uh, I've been pleasantly surprised uh, by the cooperation um, uh, of not only the DOD but other agencies as well. So this is not a got you and we're going to put you in a box and we're going to take away, uh, you know, your family jewels. Uh, we're all in this together, and so that examination is very very important, and uh, uh, it's underway right now. Uh, but by no means is, uh, is the work completed. But, but I am hopeful because there's a healthy attitude on the part of the stakeholders. Um, uh, you know, this is all, all about re, uh, reallocation and sharing. There has to be vigorous oversight um, uh, to ensure, as I said, the successful impl implementation of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, well, what is the law now, um, we also have another challenge, and that's uh, uh, Congress uh, did not pass uh, cyber uh, security legislation. So that is uh, uh, that's up to the new Congress. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw uh, 60 Minutes on Sunday, but there was uh, one segment uh, was uh, an examination of uh, of uh, the uh, telecommunications, the Chinese uh, telecommunications giant Huawei, and. Um, uh, one of the uh, objections that I had uh, of the uh, of the cyber bill that was offered in the House is that it uh, it really never dealt with um, uh, the uh, uh, integrity of, uh, of of the chain uh, and and what happens uh, with all of that. That was something that simply was not in the legislation, and I I, I think that that was very important. And I mentioned. Um, uh, this uh, uh, Chinese telecommunications company because um, that is the very question that was raised. Now, I spent almost a decade um, on the House Intelligence Committee, uh, so I, I know these issues um, pretty well and what the challenges are. So um, I also think that uh, the subcommittee is going to have to uh, uh, obviously reauthorize the uh, satellite television uh, extension and localism uh, act uh, because that expires uh, a year from now in December a year from now so um, really throughout these efforts uh, I think that you have a strong sense that I've uh, um, you know my focus has been on championing uh, being a champion for policies um, that advance innovation I mean we just cannot uh, rest on our oars hi Jerry <laughs> Thought you would just sneak in, right? Um, uh, uh, to advance in innovation, there has to be strong competition. Um, that's really in our DNA, I think. Um, uh, but it's uh, it's always through the eyes of the beholder of what uh, what constitutes competition, and uh, we want to ensure that there's a, a vibrant sector that benefits consumers for many years to come. So, uh, you know, I mean, these things become delicate uh, uh, balancing acts, uh, but nonetheless, that's our charge. And um, 
uh, for anyone that thinks that the, uh, the Congress is unimportant, is irrelevant. Um, uh, you've gotten a taste of, uh, of the weightiness of all of these issues, and uh, telecommunications represents at least one-sixth of our national economy and continues to grow. Uh, and so there, uh, there are enormous opportunities here for our future. I, I have no doubt that uh, uh, my congressional district is helping to lead the way. So it's wonderful to be with you, and uh, it's good that the papers fell because um, I'm done with them. So uh, uh, thank you again, and I, I, I again I, I want to uh, um, uh, thank the um, uh, you know the uh, uh, the caucus and its uh, and its leadership, and I'm pleased to be a part of that leadership. But all the members that are part of it and the ongoing work that's done by the caucus, it's very important. It's bipartisan. It is bicameral, and. Uh, um, and you can see the, the fruit of its work. So um, thank you. You're a very attentive audience. So I'd be happy to take, uh, take questions. And um, again, thank you to Morrison and Foster for, uh, for hosting us. And that I didn't have to travel that far to, uh, <laughs> to get to you. Nothing is that far in my district, though. So it's, it's fairly compact. Yes. Uh, can I ask you about the uh, ITU and the, the wicket process? You yes, yes, I, I, I didn't, like yes, more. yes. Um, uh, I, I think that you all know what that is and that uh, uh, there will be a, uh, uh, a conference in Dubai in, in December and uh, uh, we have uh, on a bipartisan basis, bicameral, uh, as well as the executive branch, believe it or not, there is not an inch of daylight between us. Uh, there is agreement, and there needs to be, agreement across the board, strong agreement uh, across the board uh, that our view um, and that of, uh, of other countries is that we not um, uh, segment the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the internet and that the, uh, the model that has uh, helped it to flourish remain in place. Now, there are countries that don't hold that view. And it's, a, it's very interesting when you look at the list of countries that uh, don't hold that view. Uh, they really are, they're not open societies. And so their tendency, obviously, and their choice is to <coughs> control, is to control. And so, um, uh, at the committee, we started out. Mary Bono was a, uh, a, a wonderful leader in this. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what we did was to bring forward a resolution from the committee. Uh, it was unanimous, obviously bipartisan, to be unanimous. And uh, then we uh, uh, moved that to the floor of the House. Uh, we spoke on it on the floor of the House. And uh, um, uh, we have a very able uh, uh, ambassador, Ambassador Kramer, that will lead the delegation. Uh, Commissioner McDowell uh, uh, from the uh, FCC has been an eloquent spokesman on this, uh, on this particular issue and has been uh, highly instructive, I think, uh, uh, to our committee, to the full committee, Energy and Commerce, as well as our subcommittee, uh, and to the general public because he's interviewed and he um, he speaks of this and he knows of what he speaks. So um, happily, uh, we have um, total unanimity uh, in this. And uh, we're going to have to attract, our delegation is going to have to attract um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the minds of uh, other uh, uh, countries and work hard at uh, making sure uh, that what is in place today, that open stakeholder, uh, approach and all of that, uh, that that is retained. Uh, but there are there are many concerns swimming around it. I'm, I'm not in a position to forecast what the outcome is going to be, uh, but you can tell where we want it to go. So uh, thanks for raising that. I didn't, I, I, I thought of that when I was speaking. I thought I'm not mentioning anything about that, but maybe someone will ask and you did. That's great. It's unusual to have that kind of unanimity. You know that. Yeah. First of all, thank you on your work on that issue. Uh -huh. uh, it's the one that uh, I find um, very difficult to understand. And so uh, being an outsider, I don't really understand 
who's doing what and why, and so uh, having experts on the ground paying attention to it uh, makes me feel better. Yeah, no, we'll have a very, very strong delegation. And I, I have something coming up. Uh, a bit, a bit. We've been um, setting up uh, appointments to speak, uh, telephone time and all of that with Ambassador Kramer, and his schedule keeps changing, mine keeps changing, but uh, um, I think it's very important that uh, uh, experts from the private sector uh, uh, be very much a part of this as well because they can be highly instructive uh, uh, not only to him but uh, uh, to the delegation. Is the delegation named, um, David? I have not seen the list, but if, if it hasn't come out yet, it should be any day now. This is David Grossman, our in-house expert in my office. How's that? Yeah. So can we, we speak can, with David? He'll give you a great deal of confidence about what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, can we go back to uh, cybersecurity for just a moment? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. What's your assessment of uh, the executive branch uh, trying to implement cybersecurity uh, initiatives on their own, uh, given that Congress didn't act? Well, I think that uh, you know there are some things that can be done by executive order. But there are other issues that uh, that they don't have the authority to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to implement. Um, uh, I mean, I've I've listened to what Secretary Napolitano has been saying uh, about uh, an executive order, um, and that it's almost ready, and that it may address um, uh, protections for uh, vital infrastructure systems and. Um, uh, outline, uh, uh, you know, voluntary standards for private uh, uh, companies, and uh, you know, I look forward to uh, to viewing that, but uh, taking a look at it. But uh, uh, but there are other issues that, can, as I said, that can't be addressed by an executive order, uh, funding and liability protections. Uh, those issues have to be dealt with uh, by the legislative branch. So. Um, uh, as I said, you know, supply chain integrity, uh, information sharing, those were issues that were not contained in this. And, you know, while, while I think that there was um, a lot of disappointment uh, that this issue uh, didn't mature uh, in this Congress, um, I'd rather see the effort, um, well, I, I shouldn't say fail, uh, but, um, you know, that it wasn't addressed uh, but it be brought back and that it really be an even better bill uh, because you're dealing with huge, huge issues in this area, huge issues in this area, and um, uh, we've got to get it right. Um, and, you know, I mean, the American people feel very, very strongly about privacy. And uh, so it's a, it is a, uh, it's a very, very delicate balancing act. It really is. And uh, uh, there are uh, suspicions. Uh, on the part of the citizenry about, um, uh, uh, you know, what information uh, uh, the government holds, uh, how it would be used, um, uh, telecommunications and, and uh, a, a, as a tool, and what they collect, and how people are protected. I mean, there are, there are enough issues to keep you um, uh, and your lectures and your writing uh, for the rest of your life. Just embedded in this issue. But when you think of an executive order, uh, yes, some things can be covered, and I think that the administration may be coming out with something, it, it seems to me anyway, uh, because the, uh, uh, the secretary has been referencing it, but um, keep in mind that Congress, um, as I said, you know, it's, it would be in the hands of the Congress to uh, address liability and um, uh, and the and the funding. So we'll see. Is yes. Congress done with uh, patent reform now that the AIA is in place? And oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> this is. Um, I'm sure you all read the New York Times piece. <laughs> it's quite a quite an article. Um, you can tell how important it is. It was one of the um, uh, one of the the hot items that pings on my uh, on my BlackBerry that uh, you know the the story that was coming up. So I read it the night before. Um, I think that we had a terrific patent bill 
uh, under the leadership of Howard Berman. And uh, it, was, um, it was bipartisan. Uh, it was, I think, in really a delicately and beautifully balanced uh, bill. Um, he spent time here in Silicon Valley to um, uh, learn firsthand what the, uh, uh, what the uh, needs and the concerns were. Um, it was upended in the Senate, as you know, in the previous Congress. Um, the pharmaceutical industry didn't like it, and they have, you know, considerable lobby. Um, I didn't vote for this patent bill in this Congress. I, I thought it was a bad bill for many reasons. So, uh, so your question was what? Oh. Is it going to stand? Oh, are, are you done or, or are we going to see patent reform part two soon? Well, it's hard for me to tell. It's hard for me to tell. I, I think that it, it depends. Uh, one of the things that, uh, um, uh, that could uh, uh, bring about a further readdress of the area is if there's a change in the composition of the Congress because there are different views held on this. Um, Congress doesn't have much of a stomach, uh, most frankly, and this is my 20th year, I can't believe it, um, to revisit it, a major issue once it has, it thinks it has dealt with it. And they say, we've done that, uh, we know that uh, it, it's less than perfect, um, that's the mark of human beings. We're not perfect. Legislation isn't. And uh, we've got other things that we need to uh, take on. So I'm not so sure that uh, a new Congress is ready to go at this again. But we'll see. We'll see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just piggyback on that for a moment? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, on uh, November 16th, we're going to have a conference at Santa Clara University on software patents. So uh, if you're interested, please uh, contact me or uh, Doris. Um, we're going to talk about other solutions in addition to legislation about things Good. that might be done uh, to address problems with software patents. Sorry to make No, that's all right. Field. I need to get your ads <laughs> in here. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on where we are in terms of STEM education these days and what else needs to be done? Well, the, the question is, where are we on STEM education? Um, now it's uh, some years ago uh, that I had the idea, and I took it to our leadership at that time, that, uh, um, that essentially an innovation agenda needed to be developed uh, for our country, because we we're falling back in so many key areas. And um, so we launched that effort, and uh, we launched it right here at, uh, at Stanford University. I asked uh, John Hennessy if he would host it, uh, and he said, I can't think of a more important thing for us to be, uh, to be working on. Now, that, the, the composition of that was, um, uh, was not a lot of members of Congress talking and um, sucking up all the air in the room, but rather to bring in the key stakeholders in the private sector to hear what they thought needed to be addressed. And um, uh, both from the telecommunications sector, the venture capital sector, uh, uh, educational institutions obviously uh, uh, being uh, uh, hosted uh, at, uh, at Stanford University, biotechnology, high technology. And um, then that was taken because it was really such a, um, an incredibly um, instructive uh, 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 gathering and meeting uh, that uh, uh, the leader at that time thought that um, uh, that we should hear from people from across the country. So they went to the uh, to the Northeast, to MIT, to Princeton, to uh, the Northwest, to the <coughs> Southwest, uh, to the uh, to the Midwest, um, and. Um, so out of all of that, we put that together. Now we had, uh, we passed the policy, and then when the Democrats were in, in control for that short period of time, we funded it. And STEM education is taking me a long time to get to the point, but I want you to know how that came about. STEM was, um, uh, was one of the, uh, the major planks of the innovation agenda. So it called for 100,000, um, 
uh, new teachers in science and technology and energy and engineering and, uh, and that. But you know, it, it, um, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of another effort that took some time, and that was to double the, uh, the funding for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, once Congress did that, and it was a huge, huge effort you know, to get there, it was, it was a steep hill to climb, uh, but we did it, and we did it on a bipartisan basis. Um, then Congress becomes self-satisfied you know, we've been there, we've done that, and uh, and then with that kind of attitude, um, if you don't keep it up, if you don't keep up the incremental um, uh, uh, funding and the uh, uh, adjustments that need to be made, then you end up going flat or even moving backward. So uh, while we were successful at launching that and accomplishing it, uh, I think that Congress has become self-satisfied that this is an area that um, <clears throat> we already dealt with it and it's okay. It's not. It's not. This is where we have to keep the pedal to the metal every single day. And uh, uh, we're in a, uh, obviously, a, a time for a frame now where um, all, uh, uh, you know, in the national uh, uh, campaign is to just cut, 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 cut. We have to. We have to do it right now. We have to, you know, the sky is falling. We're going to become Greece if we don't cut. Um, uh, on that issue, most frankly, the Congress has to come up with a long-term plan. If it, if it were easy to eradicate the deficit and move toward a balanced budget, believe me, if the low-hanging fruit uh, uh, would have been, you know, picked and done by now. So this is a very long answer in a broader context. We have to be willing to make these investments. We have to be willing to make these investments. And uh, I do think that it is the role uh, of the Congress to make these investments. Uh, the private sector is not going to do this all on its own. It has to be a partnership. Uh, uh, most definitely, uh, but the emphasis on um, on muscle and brawn uh, versus the brain and the uh, the training and the education. When you look at our stiffest competitors, they're making massive investments in these areas. Massive investments. So um, uh, we're not going to be uh, historians. Will not. I'm convinced. Um, historians will not write that the 21st century as an American century, unless uh, STEM is, um, is uh, invested in over and over and over. This is not a one-time deal. This is consistent. This has to be uh, in every budget, whether it's a Republican uh, president or a Democratic president, regardless of who is in the leadership of the Congress, uh, this must be a, um, uh, a top priority uh, for all of us. Otherwise, we will slip and slip and slip. And um, uh, I, I don't, I'm preaching to the choir here, so I, I, I don't want to go into what that picture looks like. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you for asking about it. Yes? Uh, can you comment on uh, the divide between Hollywood and Silicon Valley and the recent Soba Pippa fiasco? Do you think DC or Congress can help? <laughs> <laughs> well, something that some think we got in the way and others uh, celebrate what we right. did. Um, uh, I, I've really uh, not seen an effort in, um, in all the years that I've been in Congress where something, uh, where a piece of legislation was moving so rapidly, I mean it was on the, I, it was a fast track, it was just moving. There wasn't any question, I don't think, in anyone's mind that this thing was just going to go. It was going to be passed and sent to the president. And, uh, and then it flipped. And then it flipped. And co-sponsors, co-sponsors ran away with their hair on fire. I mean, it was, it was really something. It was really something to watch in a very short period of time. Now, um, this is not an area, uh, I, I know that that description makes us all kind of smile and laugh out loud and whatever, but this, it's serious. This is very serious. Um, 
it needs to be addressed. I mean, piracy uh, is simply not something that is defensible. Uh, this costs uh, uh, billions and billions of dollars to our own economy, and uh, beyond that, uh, it's the hijacking of American genius and creativity. So while a lot of reporters, and there was a lot of press, obviously, uh, on this, a lot of reporters called me because, uh, obviously, you know, the district that I represent, and was this a victory uh, for Silicon Valley over Hollywood and uh, North versus South, um, we have to get to a place uh, where, uh, where both win. We have to get to a place where both win. And... Um, uh, because we can't be without um, the genius and the innovation of Silicon Valley, which has become, uh, in so many ways, a partner and a platform uh, for what uh, uh, the uh, creative geniuses in, uh, in Southern California and what they produce. And uh, that's really, it's an imprimatur of our culture, too, around the world. I mean, when you hear... Um, people who have come to our country and talk about uh, what influenced them, uh, what shaped their thinking about our nation, what made it so attractive to them. Uh, it was uh, Hollywood. It was Hollywood and the, and the films that they saw, the expressions that, uh, uh, that were carried uh, uh, by that industry. So uh, uh, while it was a short-term victory, uh, to kill what I thought was a very bad bill, a very bad bill. And believe me, I was right there and under that effort. <laughs> um, uh, we have to get to a place where there is agreement. And I think that there are, um, you know, after the dust settled and people feel wounded and insulted and <laughs> victor, you know, all of that, all of the human emotions, uh, that cooler heads prevail and that, um, uh, uh, that people are talking to each other and that, uh, uh, that in the next Congress that we go at it. Look, patents, copyright, all of that are, um, uh, uh, are, are the foundation on which a democracy builds its uh, innovation and its creativity. And uh, again, uh, uh, piracy is the hijacking of American genius. And uh, that's, not, that's not an enviable position for us to be in. So, kind of a long answer, but uh, uh, thank you for asking it. Yes? Um, Richard Bennett with ITIF. Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, I started working in uh, Washington on public policy issues about four years ago after doing engineering here in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. for 30 something years. And the, the two biggest issues that I've run into since I've been doing that were net neutrality and SOPA. Mm -hmm. And in the case of net neutrality, it's sort of Silicon Valley uh, disapproving of the way that infrastructure providers uh, manage their networks or want to manage their networks. Mm -hmm. And in the case of SOFA, it was Silicon Valley disapproving of the way that Hollywood wants to manage its creative product. Mm -hmm. um, and so Silicon Valley has this antagonistic relationship with the infrastructure on which the internet depends. And they also have this antagonistic relationship now with Hollywood with respect to the content that ultimately flows over that communications infrastructure. Does Silicon Valley need to, be, to learn how to be a team player and get along with the other elements of the ecosystem on which it really depends? Well, I think I, I, you make a, a very interesting observation, but I think that um, uh, we're living in, uh, in a world now where <clears throat> because innovation, I mean, think about Moore's Law, uh, where innovation is moving at the speed of lightning, at the speed of lightning. And so uh, where there has been collaboration and things have worked out uh, in one setting, uh, all of a sudden there's a, uh, uh, there's a new wrinkle, so to speak. And so it really calls uh, for people to, um, uh, to keep renewing um, uh, themselves, uh, their views, and where they collaborate one day, they may be clashing the next, all right? Uh, 
Uh, but I mean, we see right here in the valley where they, where they may be, you know, suing the hell out of each other. And then tomorrow, you're going to read in the newspaper where they're uh, uh, partners and collaborating uh, on a new app or a new uh, whatever. So, uh, you know, it's ever changing. It always depends on. Um, uh, I mean, in the Congress, which moves, obviously, doesn't move at the speed of lightning, but nothing happens unless there's, there are people that are willing to collaborate with one another. So, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the flip side of that is um, that we can't afford to have anyone pick up their marbles and go home. I mean, it just, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's an old paradigm, you know, where... Uh, uh, some giant can just uh, 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 stamp out the ant, you know. Uh, now, that does happen in some instances because there are, you know, huge interests involved. Uh, but that's not a, um, it, it's not a winning approach. It's not a, it's not 21st century thinking. You have to work. If there's anything that marks this era for our country, it's politics and it's, um, I think, and it's, um, uh, as well as what goes on in the country, uh, is um, our ability to problem solve. Our ability to problem solve. So uh, no one is suggesting that these are easy issues to work out, you know. But uh, um, I, I think that the old paradigms are gone. They're not going to come back. They don't. They just don't fit with our time. We're in a different era, and uh, uh, people have to look to work together collaboratively. And you know what? You don't get everything you want. I don't. You don't. None of you do. Um, and neither will, you know, uh, whatever the commercial interests are, uh, and uh, and others. So that's it's a it's a broad answer, but it's it, it's based more on my observations of. Uh, of, uh, of where we are and um, how quickly things move and um, there has to be collaboration. There just has to be. So you know, and in the end, up, there's a, yeah. you can really create some wins. So this graduated response system that, that the ISPs in Hollywood are working on together would be an example of that kind of collaboration? I think so. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's not a to me to tell them what they sit down and talk about at the table, but uh, uh, we all know, the, you know, what the 10,000-pound uh, gorilla is in the middle of the room. So um, now it was uh, it was a high-stakes game in the Congress. It was fascinating. I mean, it was fascinating. It really was, and it was just like that, you know. I kind of enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the satellite reauthorization bill and mm -hmm. some other video. Um, issues that the subcommittee will be taking a look at. Mm -hmm. Do you see that sort of moving forward in tandem, or are those two sort of totally separate? Well, I issues? hope we can uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are some people that are asking, should the, uh, you know, uh, should the Telecommunications Act uh, uh, be reopened and whatever. I mean, it, it, you really have to, I think, really think these things through, but. Uh, do I think that we can handle more than one thing? Yes. Yeah. And I and I, I don't think there's any reason uh, for uh, uh, you know for um, what I don't know how you pronounce it the uh, the acronym Stella or Stila uh, for that to expire. You know. I mean that's the work of the Congress. That's what it was do I guess job. more I was trying to get at what Stella or whatever the new uh, reauthorization bill be called is that has sort of a history of at least uh, the having the potential for being a type of Christmas tree kind of bill or other oh everything issues everything comes. has the has the opportunity because it sort of has to happen right so do the, yeah. the other video issues kind of end up happening along with that or do you think they remain on on their own track uh, well I think you know we're we haven't begun it yet yeah. so it, it's difficult for me to um, uh, uh, to sketch out. Uh, what it looks like, uh, what um, uh, you know, key members may want to address in it. Um, that's why we have a fairly long process. I mean, we have hearings. We have hearings. Hearings are very important. 
you learn a lot in a hearing. Um, and there are, uh, are so many stakeholders that are uh, uh, that come in and advise us. And as ranking member, um, I've made sure that uh, uh, key witnesses from um, uh, from uh, uh, from businesses that would be affected uh, it, here in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, while I don't can't uh, name the uh, the majority of the witnesses, uh, I have the. Um, uh, as ranking member, I can, uh, uh, you know, call in specific witnesses, and that's very, very important. So um, once that starts, and then you hear the questions that members are asking, and what's emerging, and what, uh, uh, how we're advised, and what comes out in those hearings, it, it becomes very much a part of uh, of the collective thinking of the uh, of the uh, of the subcommittee and what uh, it's going to draw up. And, of course, there are many interests that come in and say, uh, this is a very good opportunity uh, to address fill in the blank. So it depends on, you know, who the chair is, who the chairman is, chairman or chairwoman, how's that? Um, so we'll see, but I, I think it's just too early to tell. Anything else? Yes. Uh, there are many uh, people now who have started to use the internet to share things. Uh, so it's called the sharing economy or uh, collaborative consumption or, or uh, the clean web. And now because because this use of the, this use of, it, of the internet uh, bumps into well, it's it's it uh, impacts the real world, the physical world where people uh, exchange things. Uh, this uh, 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 often bumps into many rules that were written when. Um, the, that the, this mm -hmm. ability was not there, this, mm -hmm. this possibility was not there. Uh, so I wonder what Congress is doing, uh, if that's a, a priority of Congress to look at this space. Uh, what, what's your view? Well, again, I think that, um, you know, where this fits, is there an opportunity for uh, uh, legislation that we uh, haven't taken up but is uh, left to the new Congress would something like this fit into that so that uh, you know uh, you do a, um, uh, a fix in a certain area uh, there are a whole variety of, uh, of opportunities for us to do that it's whether uh, again it's very dependent on the on the leadership of the uh, of the committee and whether uh, they think that uh, that this is important enough that uh, 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 that you carve out time uh, in order to address it. Uh, but again, it's kind of hard for me to tell um, with any specificity to say to you, yes, definitely, this is going to be taken up. Uh, we have issues left over from this Congress relative to spectrum. I mean, it's a huge thing to take on um, uh, the federal government itself in terms of being a user and a holder of spectrum. Um, but uh, uh, do I think there's the opportunity to do this? Absolutely. Uh, can I promise you that the Congress is going to do it? I can't because I, we just don't know right now. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, where this becomes important is, is if there are um, coalitions of various uh, uh, providers and or consumers that come in and say to committee members, um, this is a major area that has uh, some real holes in it uh, or real challenges in it that we think you need to address. Yeah, but believe it or not, everything doesn't emanate from um, uh, proactively from members of Congress. So, you know, we're sensitive about that. I mean, Jerry Yanowitz is here from the, uh, from uh, uh, representing California Cable. Um, He's not shy about coming in and expressing, uh, you know, what they need and why and why it'll be good for consumers and for cable and communities, of whatever it is. So, uh, you know, it works both ways. It works both ways. Now, uh, one of the FCC commissioners is, uh, uh, is going to be here this week, Commissioner Clyburn. I've had other FCC commissioners that have come uh, to the district and, and uh, uh, we always set up an itinerary to go to small companies, medium-sized companies, large companies, um, you know, the stakeholders, uh, so that uh, they can tell the commissioner uh, where they are, what they think they need, what's in the way, um, 
and I'm right there listening and uh, you know <coughs> taking that in as well. So uh, it's a it's a two way street. It's a two way street. Did I put you to sleep? <laughs> Are you just wowed? <laughs> you can tell that it's a. Uh, um, I love this subcommittee, and uh, I've been on this subcommittee uh, since. Uh, uh, being appointed to uh, energy and commerce at the end of uh, uh, my second, uh, my first term. So I've been on, uh, uh, it was telecommunications, now it's communications and the internet. But uh, I very purposefully made a bid for this subcommittee, understanding uh, how much uh, uh, its uh, its jurisdictions affected uh, uh, my congressional district. Plus, I think it's absolutely fascinating. There's not a dull moment, and um, I thank uh, you. There are so many in this room that have been uh, instructive to me uh, in my work, and um, I ask you to continue to do that because that's how um, uh, all of this works, and it helps to keep me on my toes and uh, reminds me of the vibrancy. Uh, of this place here, where we are, this very special place. Uh, yes, Morriston and For uh, Foster, but uh, in uh, uh, right here in Silicon Valley. So, uh, thank you, and um, I look forward to coming back. And uh, who knows what we're going to be talking about next year, right? <laughs> That's the interesting part of this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. briefing.